Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Revolution. Again, thanks for coming out. Always nice to see you few familiar faces. Um, I just moved into my house, um, and man, talk about uplifting your life into like craziness. Moving is nuts. Um, I pulled my back out, so forgive me today if I wince every now and then when I move. Um, Yeah, so we had more stuff than we thought. We ended up taking us eight hours to move rather than three. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And now I'm just trying to unpack boxes, but we just don't have place for things to go. So it's a lot of fun. Um, Middle of your life, having another child and moving. A lot of big things at once. I don't recommend it for the weak of heart, which I am, so... Also, my insurance just changed, which I guess everybody else is about to have that happen. <laughs> so I had to find a new psychiatrist, and that has been really horrible. So how hard it is to find somebody who does counseling, like talk counseling and psychiatry at the same time, it's almost impossible. So yeah, that's my monologue, real funny stuff. That's what I'm dealing with. Comical life. Um, Today I wanted to talk about what I just wrote down as faith in the middle. Now, I I was raised to believe that you did not have a faith that was in the middle because it would be lukewarm. And uh, so you're either supposed to have, like, I guess be radically bad or radically good you know, or get spewed from the mouth of Christ. <laughs> so, yeah, I once phrased that really wrong. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. And uh, so I try not to use that verse of me anymore. No, I'm just kidding. I just try to watch what I say. But what I'm talking about today about faith in the middle is not so much that, but the idea of you can live your life and have faith. And so many people, I feel, have been told the opposite. Because I believe if faith is what it claims to be, life is a big part of it, if not the part of it. Like, you know, you have faith without works is dead. Well, it seems like faith without life would be dead. And um, so many of us, I think, over the years, as religion has changed and morphed and turned into things, and you had your Puritans and the religious right and things like that, kind of made it seem like life is what we do after we die. You know, rather than, you know, we sacrifice everything, then we die, then we get to, you know, sit at a smorgasbord in heaven. That's what I've always thought. It's like, you know, you just sit at a big table and eat, overeat. But you don't get fat. So isn't that nice? Um, But if faith is what it really claims to be, then life is it. Uh, a quote I once heard, and I can't remember exactly who the co- quote came from. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have said it in different ways or uh, many times, is uh, someone was asked if they believed in life after death, and they said, well, you know, I don't know if I believe in life after death, but I believe in life before death. You know? And I think that's a, a good a good term. For me, I sometimes do question life after death, and, and you know, I definitely don't believe in hell. So... Sometimes I wonder if heaven's not too far behind in that. But that's not today's sermon or today's talk. But it's definitely something worth thinking about. And um, living life to its fullest, loving other people, um, what does that look like? Well, it doesn't look like what I think a lot of us are raised with, with this this choice of one or the other, you know, um, sacrifice your life, give up your life, 
you know, or, I mean, I know I'm teetering on heresy, so don't worry. Um, it's not often that I like to walk right up on the line of it, but today I do. Um, but I believe it's a good, a good point. You know, we're taught to choose one or the other. And we, in the church, a lot of people are rejected when they don't choose what seems to be the, the option of, of another, rather than, you know, I'm going to choose not to follow a, a faith that excludes my LGBTQ friends, or I'm not going to follow a faith that excludes this type of person, or that doesn't love this way, or doesn't think this way. You know, that's, in some ways, for me, I think it, those are ideas that are make or break for me. Like, I don't know if I could stay in my faith if I didn't believe that LGBTQ people were welcome and affirming, you know? Um, Is that a conditional faith? Maybe it is, but it's one of those things that I thought the way I was taught to love through my parents and through the Bible and through growing up was always love was the trump card. You know, love is what always won. Like, that book, Love Wins, you know? I mean, it was just, that was what it was, You know, Jesus loves you was the deepest theology there was. I remember when my mom would go uh, to gay pride parades, and even though she wasn't quite affirming, she always led everybody in, yes, Jesus loves you. You know, because that was like the whole point. Boom. You know, something that we forget quite easily. And we want to make it more complicated. Uh, We become addicted to certainty trying to make something that is is mystical, complete reality. And so we're stuck with this idea of believe or don't. You know, you either believe or you don't believe. And like I said before, can you blame someone for rejecting bad ideas? Or can you blame someone for saying, well, you know, I have a hard time believing that there's someone who died and rose from the dead. I mean, that, it's not like we see that every day. You know, it's not like it's easy to something grasp. Yeah, if you've been raised with it and taught it your whole life like I was, you know, you go, oh, of course, you know. I remember one time when I was in New York, uh, this friend of mine was sitting there, and he was giving this guy a hard time who was, um, what is it, um, Mormon. And I couldn't believe it. And I was sitting there, and he's like, oh, yeah, you guys believe in spaceships and blah, blah, blah. You know? And I was like, yeah. And like, it's almost like they believe like somebody could die and raise from the dead in three days. And he was like, what? And I was like, you know, I'm like, you can't sit here and condemn this person for having outlandish ideas, you know, just because your outlandish ideas have been accepted for thousands of years. You know, there was a bush, and it was on fire, and God was speaking through it, you know. But these plates that someone gave with different ideas in it, that's got to be crazy. You know, it, it's called walking in humility. It's called walking in love and grace. Um, I think that's why people who do interfaith stuff are, are, are very important. Um, even though I was raised to believe that, you know, there was no interfaith, much less interdenominational, you know. There was a right kind of Christianity, you know. We didn't even hang out with other faiths. We didn't hang out with other denominations, other Christians, because post-millennial, speaking in tongues, not speaking in tongues, of the Spirit, in the Spirit, I don't know. I remember I went to this Baptist church in this school, and I was like, hey, Mom, did you, they let me go to this Baptist school, but I thought the Baptists didn't believe in, in the speaking in tongues, and I, you know, we were, I was raised in Assemblies of God, and we bought into that and believed that, so I was like, well, I heard the pastor secretly spirit-filled. You know, so that was the that was the that was how I got to go to the Baptist school that I ended up leaving because um, the teacher seemed to be more concerned about who my parents were than me getting an education um, but what does the Bible have to say about freedom to live your life and 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 staying free and being called to freedom? It has a lot of things to say actually. Um, I just picked a couple of my favorites because. I like to go through Galatians, but I just did a huge Galatians study online before we started meeting again. So I won't be doing that for a little while for the online congregation's sanity, I guess. 
but I'm going to read from Galatians today. Galatians is my favorite book of the Bible. By uh, I just really love it and what it what it points to. Galatians five thirteen, and I'm going to jump one here, and then I'm going to jump back a little bit. But uh, five thirteen says, uh, "For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use this freedom as an opportunity for self indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another." For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If ever you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So, look at this. Is, you have to read the whole thing because this whole part, because I just wanted to read for you were called all the freedom brothers and sisters and, you know, and just leave it there. But then it says, only do not use your freedom for opportunity for self-indulgence. So that automatically seems like a don't. But if you go further, then it says, be through, but through love become slaves to one another. Now that seems a little bit harsh. You're like, what? But then it goes on to say, for the whole law is summed up and it tells us what it is. Loving one another. And why does it want us to love one another? It says, because we don't want to be consumed with one another. We don't want to bite and devour one another. We don't want to destroy one another's lives. So when it talks about freedom, it really means freedom but freedom to live in a peaceful life, not freedom to live in a constant hostility, not constantly biting and devouring one another, not constantly picking one another apart. And I always, growing up, I always had this feeling, or at least a lot of the time, I don't want to say always, but most of the time I had this feeling that God hated me or that God was disappointed with me. And why? Because the youth pastor was disappointed with me. Because the people who taught seemed disappointed with me. Because what they taught didn't seem to be possible to line up with. You know, because I had these thoughts in my head. And for some reason, I wasn't supposed to have certain thoughts, you know. Or I was uncomfortable in school, so I drank. And all of a sudden, you know, that was just, oh, that was it. You know, you didn't do that. You know, I was the kids that, I, you know, I was one of the kids that the youth pastor was warning everybody about, you know. I was sneaking off to have a cigarette, and they were more concerned about the cigarette than the fact that, at the time, my dad was in prison, for, which I didn't realize was a bigger deal at the time. I thought, oh, yeah, cigarettes are bad, and it's the devil's tool shop, you know. <laughs> and and uh, so I better put this out, you know. It doesn't matter that my dad's going to prison or that my dad's going this or that my family's suffering right now and going through a harsh time. You know, this is the most important thing is that I don't, you know. I remember my dad once said, smoking won't send you to hell. It'll just make you smell like you've been there. Um <laughs> Yeah, that was always those funny little sayings. Because I always wondered, I asked him one day why, I, why Lutherans, because there was this Lutheran church down the street, why they could always smoke. I'm like, these Lutherans they smoke cigarettes, you know? And this was when he was in prison, so he was a little bit more grace orientated. And he's like, well, oh, it won't send you to hell. It'll just make you smell like you've been there. Um, but when we get to an idea where we're not worried about the well being of others, when we're more concentrated on things that they don't do or that they do and rather than saying what is their well-being are they being cared for are they being loved are they being you know are there are their mental needs being met you know when we just say well no we're going to put everybody in this circle and we're going to make these rules and these regulations and if if people don't fit into this then they're out it doesn't matter what they're going through or what life is handing them there's no exceptions. And last week we did, uh, we, we went into Luke 15 and we talked about the good sheep and the lost coin and the son, the prodigal son, and then the good son. And it seemed like the, the father in that story was constantly willing to make, or the woman in that story or the, the shepherd in that story were constantly willing to make exceptions. We're constantly seeking out. Even when the good brother comes home, the father goes, come in, let's celebrate with your brother. He's back. He's alive. You know, it wasn't like he didn't go, well, you're legalistic, so you can't come in because you're saying this stuff about your brother. No, he just tries to reason with him and say, no, 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 come in, come in. Let's all be together. There's an inclusion there that makes a lot of us uncomfortable, but that's okay. You know, should we be uncomfortable with inclusion? Yes, it's a tough thing to do. Why does the Bible talk about dying to your flesh and dying to yourself daily? Is because when you love other people, it's a tough thing to do. When you love people who don't agree with you and you have to hold your tongue 
or you have to have a conversation rather than cut someone out of your life or have an argument, it's difficult to do. It's called adulting. It's really strange. But that's what you do in the adult life. I mean, think about if you go to work and you work somewhere with different people. You know? You know, if you can do that at work, why can't we do it in life? It got me, I guess. This is my job, so. <laughs> I just sit in the room with a bunch of people who go, hmm, yes. I like what you did there. <laughs> Not a whole bunch of people in a room, but with some people in a room. Where there are two or three gathered together, right? <laughs> or two or more. So if it's just me and one other person, we go to lunch. Even though that's two, but. Um. Yes, well, the online guests, just immeasurable, just <laughs> the mass. Um, freedom to live your life. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. I was back in Galatians. Sorry, I think I got off on a tangent. That happens to me every now and then. Um, Galatians 1, go back to uh, another part of Galatians here. It says, um, For freedom in Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So when Paul's saying do not get back into the yoke of slavery, do not get covered with that burden, he's saying don't go back to the law. Don't go back to the the do's and don'ts. It's not about that. It's about faith expressing itself in love, what we just read a minute ago. And he's about to get to that, but we're taking it just backwards a little bit. And so I love this letter because it's such a grace-loving letter, and it's such a such a freeing letter, but it's really a letter that was written in the same way that Luke 15 was told as a bit of a rebuke because he's saying to these people, don't go back to the way. You're going back to another way that pretends to be the good news but is not good news at all. I don't know how many of you have felt that in a way thinking about Christianity or thinking about your faith and going like, why is it called good news? You know, and then I remember someone telling me, my friend D.E. Polk, who's a pastor, um, with a name like that, you better be a pastor. And um, I should be like J.C. Shambach or something. Um, <laughs> I want a powerful name like that. Baker's just like, eh. Um, but it's got two Ks. So, um, but a friend of mine telling me, you know, there's a reason it's called good news. You're loved. You're accepted. You're You're okay. Just the way you are. And I never believe it. Yeah, of course I can be improve myself and do things like that. In uh, DBT, they have this thing, and it says, you know, I'm doing the best I can, but I could do better. Now, at first, that seems like a little perfectionist crazy, but what it is is it's a dialectic. It's two different things. Yes, I'm doing the best that I can, but yes, there are some areas I can do better. It's not saying that necessarily you have to be perfectionist. It's just saying you grow in life, and you learn, and you change, and you, you, you learn to do new things. I don't think there's any of us who say we couldn't use improvement. But I can tell by some of you here, your dog tired. And right now you're probably doing the best you can. You know? But as life changes and grows, we can always do a little bit better. Two things can be, the opposite things can be right at the same time. That's like faith and doubt. They exist together. Paul Tillich said faith is not the, I mean, doubt is not the opposite of faith. It's it's merely a, um, a, a, a part of faith. It is an element, is what he said. It's an element of faith. Doubt is built into faith. There's a reason, because it's not called, and he's the greatest, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, so I'll take his word on it in a little bit. Um, But, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, if it was not called faith, it would be called belief or acceptance. You know, we would just blindly, but faith is not that. Faith is something that we have to hope for, something that hope for that was not seen, evidence of hope for not yet seen. So there's always going to be a bit of doubt there. You don't hope for something that you already have. Um, that's why faith, hope, and love are the three greatest things that remain in, just as well, in Corinthians. So be free, stay free. Why? Because we don't want to get tied up to bondage of the yoke of slavery of religion, and we also don't want to use it to the point where we're tearing one another apart where we're hurting others, or that we ourselves are being hurt. 
That's good news. So, uh, had someone uh, psychiatrist my, as I was about to leave. He's you know he's like, what is revolution about? <laughs> I'm like, okay, we've been together for four years, and you finally want to know something about me. I'm just kidding. And, um, and I was like, really? You know, he's like, elevator pitch or whatever, you know, and I don't ever have an elevator pitch. Um, but I wrote, uh, I thought, ending the pain or helping relieve it that was caused by the church. That was the first thing that kind of came to my mind. It wasn't win souls for Jesus, you know, or do that. But it was kind of like clearing up misconceptions, helping people who've been hurt or torn by part by the. Now, maybe that's not a whole huge group of people. I think there's a lot of people out there who have been, but I also think there's a lot of great churches out there doing healing stuff and, and offering, uh, helping people realize that the church is, is you know, about social justice and about this, and especially in Minnesota and Minneapolis. I mean, you just so many social justice oriented churches and doing great things out there where they're fighting for other people's rights. And I said, well, this, I guess the difference is right now is that we're, we want to do that too, but we also want to make sure that the people who come through here, you know, are helped to be healed from the damage that maybe was caused by church in the past. Why don't we have music? Why don't we do certain things here like other churches? It's because for a lot of people it was, you know, triggers. Before trigger warning was a buzzword, you know, it was something that I was thinking about years ago, going, what is the type of church that I would be comfortable walking into and sitting for a little bit and then, you know, leaving? So cut out a lot of stuff. I guess if I was a worship leader, I'd feel a little bit different about it. But they had, it's funny, one time I got invited to speak at a worship conference on worship music, and I, I went. But then I went, and I was like, you guys realize we don't have any music at our... It was really bizarre. It was really bizarre. Um, so helping ending pain to, to relieve it or help relieve it, that was caused by the church. That was what I saw. Um, I read this article in GQ um, on Brad Pitt, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know what caused me to read it, but um, we had not had internet for a while, and also had internet again, so I could click on links. <laughs> So I clicked on this link about Brad Pitt and was reading this article. And I guess he grew up pretty religious. And um, he's talked about how, for him, it was always it was always about don'ts. It's always about don't. And I thought that was interesting. It wasn't even about do's or don'ts. He just said, for him, it was always about don'ts. And he found it fascinating that people were attracted to that and that he was himself in that. And, um, you know, it, 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 for so many of us, it's, that's what it's boiled down to. And I, again, I can't blame people who reject something that's all about not, don't, don't live. You know, there's certain things you don't have to do in order to live. You know, can you, there's a lot of people who, who live great, amazing lives without any faith at all, who love their neighbors and love their enemies and who do those things. And that's what we're called to do. And that is living for me. You know, Martin Luther King was killed for living, living an exceptional life. But he was murdered for it because there were people who don't like that. They don't agree with that. They don't, it makes them uncomfortable. It does, takes takes them out of their comfort zone. And unfortunately, a lot of those types of people are people that have been attracted to the church. So what do we do? If we're going to be part of the church, we learn how to love those people so we can have conversations with them and help free them from their misinformation. Because that's what it's about, is, you know, maybe if we've been raised in a church's misinformation. I hate the fact that people have to choose between bad theology and nothing. It's always bothered me. You know, because I've sat down with people and I have a lot of friends who are not believers and, and, and don't subscribe to faith, and I don't have any judgments for them. But some of them who have have said, you know, well, it was this, 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 and this, and I can't live that way. You know, I had a guy come up to me once and say, you know, I used to believe in the stuff that you did, and now I don't, and I feel better and happier than I ever did. And I said, well, what was it that you believed? <laughs> You know, because you're assuming a lot out of me, and I'm, you know, I don't want to assume in a, th- that much out of you. So what was, you know, and the things that he believed were things that I don't believe in, or things that I, even some of the stuff that I, I question. 
I go, I don't believe that was literal, or I don't believe, I'm excluding those people, I don't believe, you know. But I couldn't blame the person for rejecting that. But at the same time, they were also doing a lot of what the church does and just assuming that this is what it is, or this is who I was. And so we have to be careful about that and, and be able to show that you can live your life. You know, what it, the Bible is, is, is it's not an instruction booklet. It's not, you know, it's a library. It's a collection of books and poems and different things like that that help us learn ways to maybe live or live amongst others and help us to love others more every day. Um, but it's not a magical book. I wish it was a magical book. It would be a lot easier for me if it was a magical book. But when I went to, when I've taken classes in seminary and done other things like this, you really start to realize that it's not, you know, it gives a little disillusion. You become disillusioned. But that illusion sometimes is causing you to be uh, a mess of a human being or causing you to say, I have to either choose between this or that. Why can't I live in this middle? Why can't I live in this tension? And I think if we're truly honest about our faith, we live in a tension of something that we go, is it, is this real? Or is it because I'm an American? Or is this this? You know, well, what do I get? What, what, what are the positive things I get out of this? Well, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, you know, then I'm also supposed to love myself. I had another counselor go, gee, you sure are easy on yourself. What would you tell someone who went to your church? I'm like, all of a sudden lately, I've been asking, having therapists ask me if I practice what I preach. <laughs> and guess what? I don't a lot, you know? Well, it's okay if I call myself a piece of shit, you know? But if someone comes into my church saying, well, I just feel like I'm a piece of crap and I don't deserve this and don't deserve that, I'd be like, wait a second. It's not about getting what you deserve or don't deserve. It's different, you know? Grace isn't about that. Freedom isn't about that. So I have to remind myself of that because I like to think that I'm somehow excluded from that good news because that was the tape that played in my head. And as soon as I get it consciously, I have to watch out because my unconscious gets something different. My unconscious tries to move in and say, no, it's still this, and play those old tapes. It's really hard to set yourself free from, from abusive religion that was put into your head at a young age or any type of abuse. I, mean, I feel like I take a shadow of my past and, and put it over things that are in my future. And that does a lot of no good. does no good to help me for my future. It causes me to be paranoid. It causes me to think the worst. It causes me to think that people I love and care about don't love and care about me. And that everything is, you know, like a, I'm like a bull in a china shop. This faith that is supposed to be the bedrock, you know, you're supposed to build it on the rock, all of a sudden becomes like porcelain. You know, I just, oh, I might break it. I might fall apart. You know? Or I'm able to believe and encourage people one thing and then I do something else. You know, it, it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, does it really matter if I'm out there carousing, whatever, you know, and preaching, or if I'm at home miserable thinking that God hates me? You know, both are hypocrisy. And I know that that hypocrisy is there. So I'm able to sit here in front of you and admit that I have that and deal with that. Um, but that's what that love and that grace give me the ability to do. That's what love and grace give us all the ability to do is to be honest with one another and talk to each other how we'd want to be talked to and, 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 and live, in the, live with the friction. Um, Romans... Three, which I've always loved, and I've probably already read once in one of the sermons here already, but we'll read again. But it says 23, Romans uh, 3, 23 says, Since all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, they are now, glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. Yeah, all sin, all fall short of the glory of God. There's no one doing anything right. It goes even further on that says, you know, there's no one that does anything, you know, Right, everybody falls, everybody makes mistakes, everybody does this, no one has full understanding. All have turned aside, you know, all have, uh, have uh, together, how they have all become worthless, you know, so it goes all this stuff, but this just brings it in because he, Paul goes through this whole none are righteous thing. But I think this covers it better and easier, quicker. 
is he sums it up with this, since all have sinned and all have fallen short, glory to God, they are now justified by grace as a gift from grace. So we all have doubt. We all don't measure up. We're always going to have these things that we struggle with. We're all going to be human. I had someone uh, explain, to, explain me to someone else as being haphazardly human. And I do resemble that remark, um, unfortunately. But I do. It just is what it is. And in some ways it's a gift. In other ways it seems to be torture as a human being. I think it's a great compliment and a huge insult all at the same time. It's very Minnesotan. Oh, you're haphazardly human. Isn't that special? You know, or the southern equivalent of bless your heart. Not a good thing. Um, But doubt is part of life's suffering. We all fall short. We all won't add up. And that's a place to live. When you live in that humility you're able to be a human again and show your humanity. And that humanity is real and transparent and it keeps us from crushing other, each other. It keeps us from, from having those, as Paul said, you know, devouring or being consumed by each other. Um, Matthew I'm going a little long today. Yeah. I've been trying to shorten my sermons, so. I've failed you once again. Um, That's my preacher voice. Matthew uh, 23, 4 says uh, about religious teachers, Jesus says this, he says, they tie you up with heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on your shoulders, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. That is is not grace. That is not a life well lived when we do that to one another. But that is something that was happening, and it was being warned against here. But that's something that, in a lot of ways, faith has become, is this thing of impossible standards that they, we can't live up to, and the people who are putting those impossible standards on us or have aren't there to help lift them. Or they were in such a short part of our life that they weren't. they're not here to help us now, with the baggage that they helped us pack. They're not helping helps us unpack it. And so we need a place to do that. And I hope that places like Revolution, and I hope you have friendships and, and read books that encourage you to unpack that stuff because it's not a good place to be living in uh, impossible standards. It's not a good place to have had to live with certainty dealers. You know, they just deal you certainty. Oh, you've got to have certainty. You've got to know that you know that you know. You know, I liked it a little bit when I felt that way because I didn't have to worry as much. You know, I didn't have as many crazy thoughts and didn't think about retiring every week and just going to, you know, be a barista. Um, But, you know, these certainty dealers often give us impossible standards. But what did Jesus say about faith and Christianity? Jesus didn't say a lot about Christianity because he didn't know it was going to be called that. Um, but Jesus said in 11, uh, Matthew 11, uh, 28, Come to me, you all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So it's not offering a burden-free life, but it's saying my, my burden is light. And that's... What would Jesus do? Or what would Jesus, you know, whatever, you know? What would Jesus say? And that's what Jesus said. You know, I'm not here to crush you with impossible standards. I'm not here to give you a faith that is so extreme that you can't live or that you can't live amongst other people, or that you can't care or love for other people, or that you exclude other people, or that you yourself are excluded constantly. That's not what Jesus said. There's verses where you can take it that and read it that way, but that's why people say, you know, it's it's good to take the whole Bible into consideration, to take this verse into consideration with the other verses about the wheat and the chaff and things like that, because you've got to balance each other out a little bit better. 
Now, I'm not saying life is about balance because passionate people usually are not balanced. So I don't encourage you to be balanced, but um, necessarily because what is that? Just yin and yang. But I encourage you to to read the Bible within its actual context, the way it was written, the best way we can, if we can, because we're not going to be able to understand it completely because we're not in involved in that culture, but Jesus was extremely radical for his day. So yoke is easy. So I guess the, the, the idea of this sermon is, 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 is just what I've been reading is be free and stay free. You know, don't, you know, don't use a freedom just to ignore people and, and, and make your own life better as, as but make it, so you can live free and help others be free as well. And that we learn to hold our tongues sometimes and just be patient with one another and be kind with one another and not be jealous or boastful or proud or rude or demanding our own way. And I know a lot of you here, I'm preaching to the choir. This is things that you believe, but you know what? I don't believe it enough for my own self, so I'm hopefully when you're here, you're not just taking it towards others, but you're taking it for yourself. You know, this is a time for you to say, you who are listening, is to say, you know, this is for me too. That's where the power really comes is when we start accepting it for ourselves. And when I'm preaching to you, I'm also preaching to myself and saying this is something that I need to, to hear. It's hard not to sometimes feel like I'm stuck in the shallow end of the pool and I'm just having a hard time getting the depth of love and the depth of grace and the depth of mercy. I'm just stuck in this area where it just all seems so shallow. And life does that sometimes, especially when you're just looking at houses, buying houses, and trying to, you know, move stuff and things, and life just becomes like this, ugh, what have I consumed? How do I take what I've consumed and assumed and move into this? And what are those things that I've consumed? You know what I mean? It's like, ugh. So getting back to the reality of life and the suffering of life and people who are going through it, is an uh, important thing to do and, and, and live in that. Um, one of the coolest things that somebody did, and I'll just end with this, is, is I think one of the funny things was that someone came over to our house and brought us a meal. And usually you think about that if you've had a baby or someone died or something. You don't think someone brings you a meal when you move into a house. you know. But it was this little act of kindness that somebody did that was like, and they cooked so much that it was like for literally three days. And it was great because we were out of our minds, you know, and we're trying to find everything. You're trying to find where you packed this and where you packed that and how are you going to eat and you have to just come up with it. And then, you know, me and Karen are sitting there arguing about what we're going to eat for an hour and a half rather than just being able to sit down and eat something. You know, well, we've got to feed the kid and we've got to do this and we've got to make sure, you know. And it was nice. It was a simple, something just simple. It was just a loving thing that someone did. Just a little compassionate moment of someone who goes, oh, I've been there. I've done that. Here you go. You know, I know what it feels like. That's there. That, that sums it up for me. You know, it's empathy. Oh, I've been there. I've done that. Here you go. So our yoke became a little bit easier that day, those couple days. It's funny what you get caught up in in life when, you know, perspective, I guess. So, lose, lose your religion, you know? And in that song, Losing My Religion, he says, I'm trying to keep up with you, and I don't think I can do it. And I'm losing my religion, and I think that's what we've got to do if we don't want to have man-made religion is we stop trying to keep up with one another, stop trying to compare ourselves with one another, and uh, live life, live life to its fullest. And... Uh, You'll find that through love, especially love for the others and learning to love yourself through that as well. All right. I'm going to pray real quick. I'm going to pass the hat. Um, I shaved my head. I'm um, going to pass the hat. Uh, we're a nonprofit. If you want to give, that's great. If you don't want to give, that's great too. Um, if you want a tax write-off, you can write a check or you can give online. <laughs> So we know where your tax write-off goes. Um, but yeah, so that's how we do this. We pay rent and uh, get to come here every week. So 
as the hat goes around, I'm going to pray. You can pass the hat and look awkwardly at each other if you'd like. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Um, I ask that we uh, accept, learn to accept that we are accepted. Help us to find the peace that uh, lies within that and uh, that we would learn to accept others are accepted as well. In Jesus' name, amen.